and I came up earlier today to Manchester so that we might go and see this wonderful exhibit in the Rylands Library. How many of you haven't seen it? Well, you're pretty close to it, you know. It's one of the most uh, remarkable things to, to ponder. It's a tiny little fragment of John's Gospel, and we're going to be looking at John's Gospel, chapter 1, together in these studies this afternoon. That's not my photograph. Uh, that's an official photograph. There are better ones, but I, I just thought it was a remarkable picture because it really sums up what I would like to try to communicate today. It looks like it's a picture of an iPad, doesn't it? Yeah, can you see that? Uh, right, so you've got this modern technology, the word online availability, framing an ancient, in fact, the oldest fragment of the New Testament that has been discovered. It's a section of John chapter 18. I just, as I was looking at it today, and you could see the handwriting on papyrus, the handwriting of what might have been, uh, you know, a disciple of the disciple of the apostles. It's, it's reckoned to be the end of the, the what's it, it's about 170 AD, something like that. Of course, they can't be precise about it, but, you know, it's reckoned, I'm not making this up, it's reckoned to be the oldest fragment. So this is the grandchildren of the apostles. One of them wrote the letters that you see there. Uh, and it just really focuses our minds upon the wonder of the survival of that word and, and the even more wonderful content of that word and how we can understand it in this iPad age. And what's changed over 2,000 years? The, the iPad, of course, represents uh, opportunity and a threat. Uh, the availability of information today is astounding extraordinary, the access that we each can have to all the scholarship ever written. Therein lies the real danger at the same time. Uh, Brothers and sisters in, in those days uh, had to ponder the text. They had, well, we don't know how many books they did have available to them. I doubt if they each had their own copy of the Bible. I mean, many of the brothers and sisters were slaves, weren't they? So how would they have afforded such an expensive item? What did they do then? Well, they must have listened to it being read by those who did have copies, and they must have, to a large extent, committed to memory those words. And you think to yourself, well, that's not possible, is it? Well, nowadays it doesn't seem possible, but there are people, there are brothers, there are sisters who have memorized large portions of the Bible. And so we're told in Israel there are schools which are teaching children to memorize the Pentateuch. You know, just imagine, imagine that. Right? So the capability of the human mind is much greater than we might give credit for. And what must have happened then is that those, uh, those brothers and sisters who were slaves, who didn't have access to the word, during their tedious lives would have to think about that word, to bring those words to their minds and dwell upon them and turn them over and, and wonder what they mean. And the next opportunity when they could get together with somebody who's got the word, that that, that person would read the word out again, say, yes, I got that, oh, I, I mixed that one up. And they would think concentrate on the words of scripture. They wouldn't be reading commentaries, they wouldn't be reading articles and, and magazines, they'd just be thinking, well, that's the word of God. Those letters on that fragment in Manchester would have been read out to brothers and sisters who hadn't yet been perverted to the Trinity and the immortality of the soul and so on. Would be believing Perhaps the same as you and I, going right back almost to the days of John himself. It's been noted by uh, the experts that there are some spaces between some of the words, and they suggest that might have been a help for those who are trying to read it out loud. That's, that's the text. One of the things, you know, providentially, it's, it's amazing, you know, that the the oldest fragment of the New Testament uh, 
refers to a passage of scripture which asks what is truth on one side and on the other thou art the king of the Jews. Uh, that's, that's the passage that's brought to our minds. This is another copy of the gospel record of John. It's papyrus number 66 and it is dated about 200 AD, so not so long after. Uh, you know, we've got a sister in, um, in Mumbles Ecclesia. She's 103 years of age. So when she was a child and she spoke to older people, they would have covered close to 200 years in their memories. So it's not that far on from uh, the actual events. Now, if you look at the text there, you'll see that it's just a string of capital letters. Right? There are no gaps, there's no punctuation, there are no commas, there are no verses, there's no chapters. There's nothing but a string of letters. That was the scripture that would be read, perhaps read out loud by somebody who could understand how to read it. If you come with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, you might think this is fanciful. I, I think there may be something in that. When Paul is writing to Timothy in verse 15, he's telling him how he should behave in the house of God. In chapter 4 of the first epistle, he has told uh, Timothy to give attendance to reading. Till I come, give attendance to reading. So the first thing was to give attendance to reading. Now, how would you read a text like that out loud? You know, it would be pretty hard, wouldn't it, without any marks to tell you where a, not even a sentence begins and ends, but where a word begins and ends. came across this uh, interesting example of what's called scriptio continua. That's that the earliest records of the New Testament are written in scriptio continua. That is, no spaces, no punctuation, certainly no verses, no chapters. What I'm trying to say is that reading the scriptures was a feat of concentration and of thought. It wasn't something that you could do casually. It was something that you had to look carefully at. Now, that is um, an example, uh, quite an amusing example of scripto continua. I ask you not to read it out loud, but read it yourself and see if you've worked out what it is. Putting the punctuation and spaces in correctly, have you got the sense of it? So... In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, the apostle says to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. And you probably know that that word in the King James, rightly dividing, the phrase rightly dividing, is one Greek word, orthotomio, right? Which means to... Ortho, straight, tomio, to cut, to cut straight. And I wonder if it's what the Apostle Paul is doing is recognizing scriptio continua and says, read this, as a metaphor, read the Bible correctly. Right? Rightly divide it. Don't mix it up. Follow what it says. Concentrate on understanding what it says. If you've got that, so you all understand what that is. A woman without a man is nothing. Are you sure that's the correct? Are you sure that's correct? A woman. Without her, man is nothing. <laughs> it all depends on the punctuation, doesn't it, right? It just depends how you divide up the word. So it's an amusing example of what must have been a a task every time you saw this string of words, or rather a string of letters, to work out what it was. And so the issue about how to understand the Bible, how to interpret it correctly, how to follow what it says, is one of the things I want to reflect on before 
going into John chapter 1. And I'll tell you why. Because the computer age has created a new, or rather, a, a renewed challenge to the way we, as a community, look at the Bible. We are... And I'll come on to that now. But let me just give a quick little history lesson. And uh, this is not taken from a book. It's, it's from my own reading, so it may be wrong. But this is my understanding of how the Christian community looked at the Bible. So what's on record, the Church Fathers and the, the Catholic Church in particular, heavily influenced by Greek philosophers from whence they got a whole load of uh, nonsense Ideas had four approaches to a text. They had the literal interpretation, an allegorical interpretation, a tropological interpretation, and an anagogical interpretation. And that's best illustrated by thinking of Jerusalem. They saw when they read Jerusalem or Jerusalem, that's a place, that's a literal city. Ah, but it also means the church. It also represents the souls of the faithful in heaven. Uh, and it also is, in some sense, the future life, eternal life. So, so what the Catholic Church did was when they read the scriptures, they turned it into a story that they liked. They took phrases and words out of their context, and they applied them to their own day as they felt. And so th- their approach to the scriptures, uh, although they didn't change it in terms of transmission, was something which led to all sorts of uh, strange allegorical interpretations of things and applications to uh, events which are clearly now uh, nothing to do with what the Bible was talking about. Then came the Reformation. The Reformation wanted to sweep aside all those, not just, I'm not talking about the rituals of the church and this false teaching, but how to read the Bible. That was one of the key things. Scripture interprets Scripture was the the clarion call of the Reformation. The way to understand the Bible is to read the Bible. Uh, And there was emphasis on the literal, grammatical, and lexical exactness. What what do the words say? What is this Hebrew word? What is this Greek word? How is it best understood? How is it best translated? Compare Scripture with Scripture. Very, very sound. And you wonder then, well, why didn't they come up with the truth? (laughs) And there were two things that were constraining them. One was, as Calvin would say, the secret testimony of the Holy Spirit was telling them how to understand these these verses. In other words, they weren't just reading Scripture and comparing Scripture with Scripture. They were relying upon a feeling inside them, what they believed God was moving them to understand. And that's the way today the evangelical community reads the Bible. It's not reading the Bible as written. It's reading the Bible with an interpretive index that's come from outside. And the other approach is the, what was called the rule of faith. In other words, everything was possible so long as the conclusions conformed to the teaching of the church. You could think what you wanted from the Bible. You could interpret it whichever way you thought it read so long as in the end it agreed with church teaching. That was called the rule of faith. So though they start out with let scripture interpret scripture, that's not where they end up. And it's left to communities like us, I know of no other, but some say there might be or have been in the past other communities where a sound approach to scripture uh, interpretation is, is available. After the Reformation, there, there was this critical development. And it's this scholarship which you can access online. It's called scholarship. People talk about scholarly consensus. Uh, they share thoughts on the internet in Christadelphian chat rooms, and they try to encourage young people to accept scholarly consensus uh, around these things. But this is what the critical method developed. First of all, and quite early on, the question of human frailty in relation to divine inspiration exercised people's minds. They started to say, actually, you know, are you sure it really is God's word as opposed to Isaiah's word? Or Paul's word? Or John's word? And if it's Isaiah's word or Paul's word or John's word, how did they influence what is written? So that was one line of thought which has come right down to us today and is a common 
thought in the brotherhood. The other thing is that they started to separate the historical events from um, what is written. In other words, there's a record of a miracle. Well, look, you don't have to believe the miracle actually happened. Let's just take the record. Let's just think about the story. Let's just see what the story meant to people. In other words, the record of the miracle doesn't have to be a record of an actual event. It can be representing how people thought about the world at that time. And so they started to abandon verbal inspiration to emphasize the role of the writer and the cultural environment in which the words were written. And at that point, of course, we, we as a community would certainly understand that in comparing scripture with scripture, we are looking at the context in which a prophecy was given. But the the view that I would argue against is that that cultural environment in some way limited those words. And a classic example that's commonly going around, and if you don't know these ideas, then the young people will if they're online, if they spend their time on these chat rooms. That is that the scriptures are so contextually defined that you can't understand them without understanding what the archaeologists and the historians say about the culture of those times. That you can't understand Genesis chapters 1 to 11 unless you understand that Genesis 1 to 11 wasn't written by Moses but was written in Babylonian captivity and is referring to the mythology of the day and incorporates the understanding, turns out wrong understanding, of the universe and the world. And so it's said that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are describing a solid canopy of heaven over the earth. We know that's wrong, but bless them, they didn't understand it at the time. And that's where it goes. You're then led to rely upon the so-called scholars in order to understand the Bible. And when challenged, some of these uh, people will say, well, We will say to them, but if scholars change their mind, as they do, in an ongoing way, then won't you have to change your mind? Yes, we will. Now, that's a far cry from what I would call the sound Christadelphian approach, and I wanted to restate it, really. What is the sound Christadelphian approach to understanding the Scriptures? First of all, Scripture is God's revelation, written to be understood in context and by comparison of passages identified by direct reference and allusion. This is the Christadelphian Bible and concordance. What does it mean? Well, let's look in the scriptures. The meanings of words are defined by their use in scripture. That's what we say, isn't it? Uh, If you want to know what it means, where else is it used? How is this phrase occurring? We will see types. Sometimes we might think some brethren of too fanciful in their imagination of seeing types everywhere. But types are indicated in Scripture. We're told in the New Testament, see, certain things are types for us to understand. So if we follow Scripture, we will not come up with imaginative ideas, but come up with what Scripture is indicating. And we avoid dependence on commentaries and scholarship. In fact, the word scholarship is like a red rag to a bull for for many of us, uh, and I think that's, that's so it should be. Do we emphasize the human element, brethren, above the word of God? Do we say that this is Paul's thoughts or Luke's, you know, Luke, you know, Luke included a lot of things about uh, navigation, so he must have been a keen sailor. Do we, do we include things like that uh, when what we're talking about is the word of God? Do we treat the scriptures merely as a textbook and and misunderstand the beauty of its literary form? So, and you can see some of the modern trends, existentialism. What does it mean for me? This is what it speaks to me. I don't know what it means to you, but this is what I take from it, as if somehow that was any validity at all, as opposed to what does God communicate to each of us? So I wanted to put that before you because I think we need sometimes to refresh our thoughts about what we're engaged in. That little Ryland's fragment is asking me 
challenging me to think, how should I properly read and interpret this word in a 21st century context? And I think the Christian approach is not just a Christadelphian approach. It is academically incredibly sound, it turns out. We don't follow it because of that. But when you go into it and, and you read a bit, you understand that actually we, we've been on the right track. We've compared scripture with scripture. It turns out there's a word now, intertextuality. That's what the scholars talk about. That's what we've been doing for 150 years. Realizing that, you know, when, when one passage is read, you can hear another passage coming through. Yeah, we, we, we got that point. So let's just, just tackle this question then about whether the Bible is so rooted in its time that you have to try and, you know, go in a time machine and go back to that time and, and find out how they thought in order to... And, that, and if you don't have the scholars to help you, then, then you're, you're going to be pretty lost. And I think the answer is pretty simple. Let's turn this one up. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come upon you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which is in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, and to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. So that's a pretty clear thing, isn't it? That the prophets themselves, though they lived in a time and place, were speaking words which had to do with the understanding of generations to come. What they saying was not constrained by the time in which they lived. God was speaking through them, maybe making reference to things in their environment, but words which should be understood, otherwise there was no point in them, words that should be understood by generations to come by listening to those words. And just you want to make a note, First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, says that these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They're written for our admonition. So the apostle is not agreeing with that point about text being uh, rooted in the culture of the time. He's saying that it rises above the culture of the time and speaks of eternal things to be understood by generations of ordinary people who are giving careful attention to that text, trying to rightly divide it. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says something very similar. So we go back to basics. We go back to reading that word. If you're in First Peter chapter 1, which is where we just turned to, and that's where the first title's talk came from, you'll see there that the apostle is making one of these great uh, connections of thought between Scripture. Scripture is interpreting Scripture. First Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. I'm going to try and get on to the Gospel of John now. Right? But, but bearing in mind, we're going to be a little bit self-conscious about how we are trying to understand the text. How is it we come to the conclusions we do come to? Things that we might take for granted. Right? Now the, the, the problem is I think we have to rediscover this in a computer age because I suspect that so many talks and so many questions that we might have about Scripture are answered by Google rather than by looking at the text and comparing Scripture with Scripture turning it over in our minds and thinking about it, talking to brothers and sisters. I mean, when was the last time you came to a fraternal or Sunday meeting or even a Bible class where you had a conversation about the word outside of the meeting? When was the last time somebody came to you and said, I'm really struggling with John chapter 1 verse 14. I, I, I can't understand. Could you help me? Oh, I've been working on this. What does this passage mean? When was the last time? Well, my experience, Francis, is that rare opportunities, rare, rare conversations. Now, I come you know, to, to Lancashire, bastion of the truth, and uh, a place where Bible study is, uh, is in, it's in your blood, all right? So, so you might say, well, that's South Wales for you. <laughs> but I, I just wonder if we really are searching that word together as if we were, you know, slaves couldn't afford a copy of the word ourselves and, and you've got a Bible, what is it? To, go, please, tell me. 
And when you go to, you know, mission fields, I don't, haven't been there much, but uh, the, the little uh, opportunity I have had uh, in South Africa, I found the new brethren and sisters that were so voraciously feeding upon that word. You know, you finish the talk, but you haven't finished. You can't get away. They, they want to come up and say, did you say this? It's that? Like, oh, wow, look at that. And it's the oh, wow factor. Does it, wow, does it really say that? And I was in California recently. We had to visit the family, and a brother was, uh, we, we met a brother who was, uh, very, lived in a very um, uh, resource-poor environment, right, in, in uh, the Californian hills. And he, he was a gentle, quiet brother, but he loved to talk about the word, and he was in, driving to his, pick him up to bring him to the meeting. And when you talk about it, you go, wow, wow. That's the way the word affected him. Now, I just wonder, brothers and sisters, if we could try to rekindle that amazement and wonder uh, about the word of God. That, wow, does it say that? And, you know, this is, this, you know, oh, I know that. No, you don't, wow. Yeah, we might know the link, but this is, this is an amazing thing. We've got to turn to Isaiah 40, haven't we? As this is the, the passage comes from. You see, what, what, what Peter is saying, uh, this inspired word of God, he's saying that we've got to be born again of the word. We've got to be brought to life by this word. Somehow these words written on papyrus and parchment have got to be in our minds and change the way we think. Excite us. You know, we've got to look at the pages of a Bible or whatever you're doing. Maybe it's on your iPhone. I don't mind what you've got it on. But it's got to be exciting. Now, I think if we were honest and took stock, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. To ask how excited are we by the word of God, by the daily readings? How energized are we by it? You know? Uh, how, how, how can we expect our young people to be excited by it then? We can't, can we? But it is really exciting. You know, we are flesh. We are grass. This is just the way it is, you know? It's beautiful spring out there. The grass is green, you know? If we get a bit more sun, it'll, oh, it'll all go limp. and It'll fall over and... Uh, it doesn't endure forever. But the word of God does endure forever, and that's what we've got to get into our minds. Uh, when you go to Isaiah 40, what you've got is a really interesting uh, chapter because it's a chapter which uh, links up to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you're in Isaiah chapter 40, you notice verse 13. You've probably got it in your margin. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him. That is a... A, f- a verse which is quoted by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So scripture is now going to interpret scripture. When the Apostle Peter's writing to us, he says, I want you to be born again of the word of God, because all flesh is grass, but the word of God is alive forever. So if you get that word into you, you're going to live forever. So, okay, well, Peter, where'd you get that from? I haven't heard that being read out for ages. Well, find somebody with the scroll, get Isaiah 40 open, put your mind in Isaiah 40. Okay, read Isaiah 40 for us, would you? And somebody stands up and reads Isaiah 40. Now, you haven't got it written down. You're trying to listen. I've got to go to work in a minute. What's it say? And you listen. It says, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? God's power and might doesn't require the wisdom of scholars to be interpreted. God's power is sufficient. And Isaiah talks about the princes of this world in verse 23, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. So when you're reading Isaiah 40, you still say, well, actually, you should be careful about those wise people, those scholars, because in God's estimation, they are as nothing. All these cultural experts of the day, no, the word of God is eternal. It's not bound by a civilization or a culture or a time. These are eternal things. And you'll see there, just, uh, we won't be able to look them up, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the apostle 
draws upon Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 16, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, have been his counsel, hath taught him. And what's the significance of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for the, uh, the theme that we're trying to develop? What is the significance of it? It tells us how to study the Bible. Right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And when you look carefully, you'll see that the spiritual things are in parallel with the words which are being taught. The way to understand the word of God is to compare spiritual words with spiritual words, to do what we as a community have excelled at, which is to know our way around the Bible, to hear words connecting passages and to feed upon that. First Corinthians chapter 2 is a warning based on Isaiah chapter 40 that we must not be sidetracked by the wisdom of this world in understanding the word of God. It does not require a knowledge of scholarly consensus to come to a right dividing of the word of truth. Now you might say to me, well, why is he going on about that? Because when you go to California, Australia, New Zealand, South Wales, the Midlands, Israel, Germany, the same idea crops up in all these places. Young people some now leaving the truth, coming from strong Christadelphian families who've got a set of thoughts in their head which is rather similar across the world. It's no coincidence. It's all done on computer in the privacy of their own iPhone uh, where these, these ideas are, sh- are circulated outside of ecclesial control, outside of a range and brethren knowledge uh, and gain credence uh, in the milieu that is created by the chat room uh, phenomena. Right? Now, I think uh, we have as ecclesiastes to face up to this, to understand what those ideas are and to deal with them. And the way to deal with them, I think, is to rediscover this word of God in the excitement and the simplicity of the way it is written. And I'm going to not jump into John chapter 1. I'm going to ask brothers and sisters, take honest stock. I try and do it myself as well. Do we do the Bible readings out of duty or out of love? What do we do? Do we go to Bible class to sit through a talk and say at the end, well, that was lovely. And if we were challenged to say, so what, what, points, what points did he make? We'd be hard-pressed to think of one. You see, we can live within a framework of religion and our minds be befuddled by the tiredness and the philosophy of this world and all the other things that crowd into our minds and lose the wonder and the excitement of the word of God. And what I'm going to do is allow you to break, tell me I'm wrong, and then when we come back, I would like us to look at John chapter 1 afresh and see if we can, just simply by reading it in the right way, determine how the gospel record of John is telling us what Peter's been trying to tell us, that we must be born again of the word of God.